Devin loves working at the U.S. Botanic Garden, where he combines his professional communications experience with his personal passion for plants and gardens. Before the USBG, he worked at American Rivers, where he completed a number of unique conservation communication projects, including partnering with Google to map all 286 miles of the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon for Google Maps Street View. He holds a bachelor's degree in agricultural communications and Spanish from Auburn University and a master's degree in Latin American studies with a focus on international environmental communication from the University of Florida. Devin has been a regular visitor of the garden for more than 20 years. So with that, I'm gonna say, take it away, Devin. Hello and good evening, everybody. We're excited to have you uh, virtually with us tonight to celebrate our bicentennial for the U.S. Botanic Garden. Uh, you see a fourth box on the screen here with us. That's Dr. Susan Pell. She's our Deputy Executive Director. She's going to be joining us and really monitoring that chat um, and the questions tab throughout the entire presentation. She'll be doing a lot of answering of questions there. Um, so watch for those answers coming through uh, actively throughout the presentation. We will save some time at the end here for, uh, for live conversation and questions, and Susan will come back on the camera and we'll talk about things then. But I did want to let you know that she's live here with us in addition to Libby. So we've got a full team ready um, and lots to talk about because there's 200 years worth of stuff. So with that, uh, I'm going to make the presentation big and we'll kind of jump in. So you should be seeing the, uh, the presentation now as the large portion of your screen. And I just want to say we're so excited. You know, 200 years is a great milestone. The U.S. Botanic Garden is the oldest continuously operating public garden in the United States. Um, and we've got a great history to share with you. And really tonight, I'm gonna to celebrate a little bit of what we uh, have done to celebrate our bicentennial and then go kind of through chronological major points in our history. How did we become the garden that we are today? You might've seen in the title, um, this is a two-part series. So tonight we're really gonna focus on the early roots of our history that, and all the points that get us up to 2020, up to our 200th anniversary. And then part two, we'll really celebrate what is the garden today, our major science, our major plant collections, education, and then where are we headed into the future. And so uh, with that, we're going to uh, jump in and celebrate. And I do want to say a special shout out and hello. We've got a lot of the U.S. Botanic Gardens volunteers joining us tonight. Um, we're so grateful for them and the work that they've done for us for so many years. And so special shout out to our volunteers. I want to share this graphic here. This is uh, all about our exhibit. So early last year, we were able to open an, an exhibit celebrating our bicentennial. And that exhibit really is a lot of the foundation for this presentation today. And the, the exhibit's titled The United States Botanic Garden at 200, Deeply Rooted and Branching Outward. And tonight, we're really going to celebrate those deep roots. If you've not been to the U.S. Botanic Garden before, I do want to give you a few statistics because you might be thinking, well, what have I gotten into? Who, what is this organization? Um, so we are celebrating our 200th anniversary. Um, we were founded in May of 1820, and we are an independent federal agency. Since 1934, we've been administered through the architect of the Capitol. So if you ever see that AOC, that's what that stands for. We usually have more than a million visitors that come to the garden every year. We have over 50,000 plants, about 50 to 55,000 plants that we maintain. And of those, uh, over 10,000 of them are permanently accession plants, meaning they're the core of our collection, either for conservation um, or science purposes, and we have about 70 employees. Super quick overview, we'll, do, we'll dive way deeper into who is the garden today and our collections and stuff in part two, so we hope we'll, you'll join us for that. So 2020, 200 years, a big year, right? A big celebration. We had three main components to the celebration, so I wanna share what those were. There was an exhibit, there was a special site-specific stick work sculpture, and there was a special exhibit with our friends at the Library of Congress. I'll share a few photos showing you what those other elements were about. So don't worry about the text, I'm gonna tell you what was going on. First, if you've been to the garden at all since the fall of 2019, so a few, few months before we turned 200, um, the artist Patrick Doherty came on site and we harvested a whole bunch of invasive plants, Norway spruce, Siberian elm, cherry hybrids, and willow. And they were all put together with volunteers and wove this incredible stick work sculpture. It's on the lawn on the west side of our conservatory. And I want to show a short little time lapse through three photos here showing the process. These are some of our great volunteers and employees. Everything came in, had to be cleaned up and trimmed and de-leafed, and that's some of this work happening here. And watch how it transforms from that into 
things going vertical. Holes dug in the ground, uh, the artist laid out his vision for how to, to really celebrate and, and uh, build this sculpture. So everything started going up and then it got woven together. And this is Patrick Doherty, the, the sculptor. He, and along with many of the volunteers and employees, worked over 800 hours over the course of three weeks to build this. A lot of the volunteers and stuff that are on tonight were part of that process. So if you were a volunteer or someone that signed up uh, to, for this sculpture process, thank you. Uh, it was a joy to build this. Um, here you see it, it's still standing on the West Lawn. We actually just had it refurbished a few months ago. Um, our goal is to keep it up for another one to two years maybe. And so, you know, we hope to continue to be able to share this um, celebration of, uh, of, a, of a stickwork sculpture outdoors for another year or two. If you want to learn more about it, there's that URL on our website. There's a time lapse video and all sorts of stuff. Liddy's just dropped in the chat. Thank you very much, Liddy. And the other item that I wanted to celebrate is right up the hill from us, the Library of Congress was able to do the special three little vitrines exhibit celebrating our bicentennial. And I'm gonna dive in and show you what's inside. Well, this is a pretty photo, it doesn't really show you what's in there. There are all sorts of original manuscripts and letters and artifacts that the Library of Congress holds in their collection that relates to our history. Um, things like letters from George Washington, papers by James Madison on botany and botanic gardens, um, drawings, you see here drawings and photos through the years. This next one shows a really cool original collection of stereograph photos. I've got those digitized and scanned in. You'll be able to see them in full screen in just a little bit. But we were really excited to partner with uh, the Library of Congress to, to do this little display there up at the library, and we thank them for doing that. That was in spring and summer of last year. So this brings us to part three. I've got a few photos here to show you what tonight's presentation is really based on. This is one gallery of the two gallery exhibit that we installed um, last February, celebrating our bicentennial. You can see all sorts of images and there's interactive game elements. I'll show you some of those here. Um, this is sort of a ship section that has a lot of science interactives. Um, this is a family doing a seed search, trying to figure out what uh, the different seeds, how they function and get, get scattered throughout. We actually were really excited to partner with the Naval Museum and get three ship models that they had in their archives that date back to the U.S. Exploring Expedition that brought back our founding collection of plants. You'll see us talk about that expedition in just a little bit, but there are some of those models that the gentleman's looking at. And some really cool interactives of making brass rubbing, some pieces of plant art, and some games and stuff that you can see there. And the other gallery celebrates what's the garden today and into the future, kind of what the part two program would be about. And we have a special scientific model there. That's a life-size bronze sculpture of a corpse flower, a Morphophallus titanum, um, and in fact, one of our volunteers is over there looking in one of the um, magnifying glass, magnifying scopes at some plant pieces underneath. That's a quick look at what physically was on site for the exhibit. Let's talk about what is our actual story here. Our roots go back even before our founding. And so tonight we're really gonna just jump through chronological time and celebrate some of those major points in our history. And our story starts back in the 1700s before we were officially founded. Um, they were planning out this new federal city, Washington, D.C. Um, there wasn't a city there before, and in writing a letter to some of the city planners, George Washington said, I think there should be a botanic garden, and here's a few potential places where it could be located. So we have this really cool letter from George Washington supporting that idea, and the founding fathers were thinking of plants, right? They were thinking of what could be grown agriculturally for food and crops and cash, and what was this young nation going to be founded on? And so you know, a botanic garden would be able to grow and distribute and think of plants and celebrate them with the people. Here is a copy of that original letter from George Washington. Um, this was on display there at the Library of Congress, but they've got that in their archives that they bound into a book. And this is, this is the page that's open there that says that uh, here's some ideas for where to put a, a botanic garden. I think it's a great piece of history that we have ties back to George Washington. So 1817, a few years later, we've still not come quite to fruition, but we're close. And Dr. Edward Cutbush was an early crusader. Also, I love his last name because great, great plant, plant pun there associated with his name. He was giving an address to Congress in the year 1817. And here's a short excerpt. It was all about botanic gardens and why there should be a botanic garden. But I love this quote. By establishing a botanical garden, we may not only receive instruction ourselves, but excite a spirit of inquiry in the minds of the rising generation. And I love that. I think we still hold that ethos very dear to our heart today. Uh, we have a lot of programs that really celebrate and support um, science inquiry in the younger generation, in children of many different age groups. Um, and so some, maybe some of you have participated in some of those or have family that have, um, but I love that quote. 
And just the very next year, the early piece of our history started. So 1818, an organization called the Columbian Institute for the Promotion of Arts and Sciences, long name, they were founded. And they really are a key to our history because they petitioned for land on the, Congre uh, on the Capitol grounds to be able to have a garden. And uh, the legislation was drafted in 1890 and fully signed by both Congress and President Monroe on May 8th of 1820. And this is the drawing that lays out the five acres of land that were approved for forming a botanic garden. And this is our initial start. And we've been up and running for a long time now. So kind of what happened and what did it look like? We don't have any photos because that was a, quite a long time ago. We don't have any photos of the garden or direct drawings of what that first garden area looked like. But this is a image um, of that era that shows the Capitol as it looked then. You might notice the dome looks a little different. And the garden area would have been essentially to the right of the trees that you see. So just over there, right in the middle of what is today the National Mall, the area that's that Capitol reflecting pool. If you've ever been to the Botanic Garden or to the Capitol, you've seen that area of water. We were all in that area. Um, and we have been, for, we were at least for a long time. So 1820, all the way till 1837, about 17 years, the Botanic Garden was run there. They kind of ran out of money. They kind of stopped functioning. And so there was kind of a question of like, what was going to happen to the garden? Well, the very next year, something happened that Congress did that really became a key to our foundation. The Congress sent out the United States Exploring Expedition. This was six ships with a whole lot of crewmen, 356, sent out to circumnavigate the globe. They were going around the globe. They, were, they had scientists, they had botanists and horticulturalists, and they were mapping things that had never been mapped before. Um, they brought back cultural artifacts and they brought back plant artifacts. And this map, if nothing else, just think of it as a heat map. This map shows all the places that those ships went over the course of those four years. So a lot of places, literally from top to bottom in all the oceans, but the red areas are where they spent most of their time. So you can see that kind of in the tropical areas. Um, but they did get all the way to Antarctica. Um, and they did bring back plants and they did study plants. These are some drawings. Um, they had two artists on board. In addition, you see four of the names there that had direct uh, plant science ties. Um, and so we had this really cool collection of art that was created associated with plants that were seen on the trip and they brought back plants. And so I wanna celebrate that. So what did they return with? 50,000 dried botanical specimens. These formed the creation of the US National Herbarium that's housed over in the Smithsonian. They brought back 4,000 cultural artifacts. These were given to the Smithsonian and they are held in the Smithsonian collection. A lot of those are now have photos and are digitized online that you can actually research and look at those and you can sort them by the US Exploring Expedition to see what they have in their collections. And they brought back hundreds of living plants. And I love this juxtaposition here. This is an illustration from those artists on, uh, from that exploring expedition of the ferocious blue cycad. And this is a plant still alive today that dates back to this US exploring expedition that we have in our collection of the Botanic Garden. In fact, we have four. Let me show you some more of those. We have four plants today that date back to that um, founding collection from that, that landed in 1842. Congress said, hey, we've got these living plants, let's reinvigorate and kind of reestablish that, that botanic garden. Um, and these are four plants that we have. The Queen Sago, and that's the sort of palm looking things down in the bottom right photo. If you've ever been to the garden court, that first room that you enter when you come to the conservatory, you're gonna see that right in front of you. There's a vessel fern, which is in the primeval garden. That ferocious blue cycad I just showed you on the previous slide is in our desert's house. And we have a jujube, it's the one plant of the four that's outdoors, it's in Bartholdi Park. And that's a photo there of the, the jujube fruits. Um, and uh, I think it's really cool. We have some living pieces of history that you can still see that date back to early, early on in our history. And you might ask, how did they bring back living plants, right? Ships out on the open seas for many years. Well, some new technologies made the plants coming back live possible. The biggest one was the Wardian case. That's an image there from the 1800s of a Wardian case Essentially, they were mini, miniature greenhouses, and they were built expressly for this purpose to be able to carry living plants. And so these living plants, a lot of them are tropical in nature, and they were brought back uh, using the Wardian cases. And the other technology that really benefited the scientists and artists on the trip was the camera lucida. And there's a drawing there, an illustration on the top. But essentially, it functioned by 
projecting uh, an image of what was in front of the, the person via mirror down so the artist could do a quick sketch on a piece of paper. And so a lot of the pieces, uh, the images that they saw, they were able to do quick captures using those camera lucidas. Um, and you can still find versions of them if you want to buy some online or something. Um, we actually did a program a year ago that really celebrated the camera lucida. Um, so you can still find those if you want to play with those. They're fun technology. Simple, but they work. Um, actually, yes, let's continue forward. So we come back, 1842, the plants are back in the United States. They came in in New York Harbor. They say we're gonna reinvigorate the Botanic Garden. Well, we need a greenhouse to really take care of a lot of these tropical plants that would not survive DC winters. And they had to create one. They had to construct one there at the foot of the Capitol. So for eight years, 1842 to 1850, the plants lived inside a greenhouse behind the US Patent Office. And that Patent Office today is the National Portrait Gallery in DC, same building. Um, and finally, in 1850, this Victorian greenhouse that you see that photo of was finished and it opened. And so you can see an image there kind of for scale. You see a few people. This was hand colored um, at, at the time or a few years afterwards to sort of bring it a little bit of life. Um, so the trees didn't actually look quite so perfectly green and black like that. Um, this is a really early photo though, and I love it to really capture the sort of Gothic uh, style of that first Victorian greenhouse. However, our greenhouse expanded greatly shortly after it was opened. And so I've got this collection of photos just to kind of give you a sense. I'm going to show each one of these photos full size so you really understand the impact. But our greenhouse space, it, it more than quadrupled. It was a, a big change just within 20 years or so after we were created. So if we look here at this really early photo from 1858, you can see that's our, our conservatory there. The new dome was being created at the, at the US Capitol, not finished yet. And these are canals um, that were inside the National Mall that were used for transport and moving um, all sorts of building materials and stuff. Um, and there's that canal again, and you can see a little closer shot a few years later, 1865, they'd finished the uh, dome there at the US Capitol. And then this is where the big change starts happening. We'll stop here for a second. This is that brand new central palm house, a lot taller and bigger than that first Victorian greenhouse. Um, and you can see there's a structure up the center. That's a chimney that was used to keep the room warm and it also functioned that a staircase could go around it. Um, and we're gonna look at a side view of this. So let's jump to a side view. You can see that central palm house there in the middle. So on the right, that's that original Victorian greenhouse. So they built a wing that runs in between it, the central palm house, and they're going to mirror it on the other side. So right now, we're slightly south of the conservatory looking northward. So that's the view you're going to see here. And check out from 1867, just a few years later, 1873, here's an image of the fully completed new conservatory. And you can see that mirrored Victorian greenhouse on the other end of the complex. And check out all of these support greenhouses. There are actually a total of 14 support greenhouses there on the south side. They were used for growing a lot of the plants that were going to be on display, starting new seeds and stuff and there were some edu education classes. And so we love that there was some education and uh, lectures and stuff that were happening back then. I love that just a year after that photo, this was a very prominent DC travel guide book that was put out that had this beautiful illustration of our fully completed new conservatory. Um, you can see people, this is looking from the north side. There was a really cool small fountain, not a big one. There's gonna be a big one that shows up in this area two years later. Um, but a beautiful illustration there in 1874. And this is that very palm house. The photo itself was taken a few years later. This was 1918, but it's one of the very first show photos that shows really detailed images of some of the plants that were being grown at the time. And I love it for that reason, because if you look in the middle of the fountain area, see the thing that's kind of exploding upwards and out, that's papyrus. We still grow papyrus today at the Botanic Garden. Um, there's some in our med uh, Mediterranean house. And if you look kind of behind the fountain on either side before you enter that central door, there's a lot of kind of desert arid plants. So sort of agaves and aloes and that sort of stuff. We still have a big collection of those today in our world desert house. Um, you might notice two other things about it. One, there's a plant sticking out the top of the conservatory house. You know, we still do that sometimes today. We actually just removed some panes of glass in our desert house a few years ago when we had a century plant an agave that put up a huge spike. We removed the, uh, the painted glass right above it to let it shoot out through the roof to do its full um, flowering cycle. And I can also tell you the bees that live on the roof of the conservatory were super excited to have all of those flowers busting through the top of the conservatory. The other thing to point out is at the very top, you see that small fence. 
and the cupola, that actually was where that staircase that wound around the, um, the central chimney uh, led you out. Um, Allison thought I said pirates. I did not say pirates. We did not have pirates at the Botanic Garden that we, that we know of. This is an amazingly detailed look inside that palm house. This was a half-page illustration in Harper's Weekly from the year 1869. And what I love about it, Harper's Weekly was huge. They were the most widely read journal of the entire United States at the time. So, you know, think of this as sort of having a half-page illustration in the New York Times today. You know, a major story. There was a whole article written up um, associated with this image that said the U.S., you know, the Botanic Garden was one of the best attractions in Washington, D.C., and you couldn't ask for anything better than that. Um, and I love that you can see that really central chimney with the staircase around it heading up to the cupola uh, in this very detailed image. I also see some plants that look like bananas. We still have a lot of bananas in our, in our plant collection today celebrating food and economic plants. Um, looks like there might be some bromeliads and pineapples. This is an amazing image. Um, we've got this image on our Flickr page that you can see in super large, high resolution size. We're gonna give you links to some of our social media and stuff. Um, at the end, but if you ever want to see this even more in depth and really zoom in, we've got it uploaded for you. This is the earliest known photograph we have of employees. So this was taken in 1910 and they were standing out in front of that palm house. The archives don't have any information about who these people were. Um, and if you have any family members that you've ever heard, any grandparents or great parents, great grandparents or anything that you've ever heard worked at the Botanic Garden, we would love to hear about that. And especially if you had anyone around this era, we would love to learn about who these people were, their names, their stories, to be able to share those and celebrate those. The only person we've been able to identify in this photo was the guy all the way at the left side with the hat on. Um, that's George W. Hess, who did become the director actually a few years after this photo was taken in 1913. Uh, I see Dan is asking where the birds inside the conservatory. It does appear there were birds inside for a little while. That, that illustration clearly had some birds. Um, we have had some other animals pop in our conservatory through the years. Um, most of them were not actually released by us. Uh, sometimes we've had some visitors who brought some of their tropical-esque animals and released them thinking they were giving them at home. That can be troublesome for a botanic garden, right? Like maybe they're eating the leaves or eating the plants. So they can be quite disruptive in a botanic garden setting. So we don't have any um, such pet sort of animals that live inside the um, gardens of the conservatory today. Although we do sometimes get some bees and butterflies and birds and stuff that come in uh, if we have the windows open. However, I mentioned a minute ago that there was a small fountain out front. Well, there's about to be a very big fountain. 1876, the United States is having a huge centennial celebration in Philadelphia called the Centennial Exposition. And there was a fountain, huge fountain, 30 feet tall, 25 tons, created by Mr. Frederick August Bartholdi. Uh, called the Fountain of Light and Water. There are some lighted, uh, lighted uh, lamps, and we'll see those in, up closer in just a minute. But this is a photo from the Centennial Exposition in 1876. And the guy was working on another project you might have heard of, Statue of Liberty. It wasn't finished yet at this point in time. The torch was on display uh, at this same Centennial. But he was there to display his craft and also to try to sell some models to raise some money. Um, he didn't get any buyers, and by the end of things, um, the famous landscape architect, Mr. Olmsted, recommended to Congress that they should buy the fountain and move it to D.C. And the very next year, that's exactly what happened. So 1877, this massive fountain comes to D.C. And it's placed there on the north side of our conservatory amongst our gardens. Um, this is a photo a few years into its, into its run in 1896. Um, but you can see it there. And in fact, it was one of the first items that were lit up at night. And it became a very big gathering spot for society in late 1800s in Washington, D.C., together to be seen and be seen at night. Um, and it started with gas lamps. It was electrified in the early 1900s. Um, so it's been continuously lit through its whole time period. And I want to share, I love that there's also all these women that had gathered in 1896. Bicycles were a big craze in the late 1800s. And you can see several of those in these photos. The fountain, the gardens have been in pop culture throughout our existence. These are some early photos from around the turn of the century, from around the 1900s, um, showing, this, I, I pulled these to put in the Bartholdi Park section. There's a lot showing the, the conservatory and stuff as well. But I love these, showing some of the different fountains through the times, putting some dramatic ice hanging from it, which slightly you know, scares me, because that can definitely hurt some of the plumbing inside of a fountain, but makes for a very dramatic postcard. Uh, but we've also showed up in animated, uh, 
stories in the past few years. We were on American Family at one point. Um, they were making a trip to the National Botanic Garden, and it clearly was our conservatory and uh, Minecraft and all sorts of different places. And so we've enjoyed being a part of pop culture in the U.S. for almost 200 years now. And something else was really popular in the 1800s, stereographic images. So these were two images put side by side, taken at slightly different angles, just the same way that the human eye works. And I put this photo from our exhibit in to show you the little device that you would use to look at them. So essentially it had two, it was a viewer that had two little um, eye areas and it would hold the, uh, the stereographic image a few inches away from it. So when you looked at it, it actually rendered the image in three dimensions. Um, and I, I wanna show a few of these that we have in the archives. And these were some of those ones that uh, the originals are at the Library of Congress that they've digitized. Um, but look at this really cool image of some visitors uh, out front of the conservatory there. These are all from the, either the late 1800s, or the early 1900s. Um, if you're ever able to do magic eye where you can kind of cross your eyes, you can do that same thing and make these images into three dimensions. We've also got these um, in high resolution on our Flickr page, which Libby has dropped a link to. You can get to it on that slash history webpage that she's just dropped the link. There's a, they're embedded at the bottom of that page. This is a peek inside that same Palm House uh, several years after that dimension, uh, after that, uh, sorry, Harper's Weekly Drawing was, was held. But you see some of the same plants, bananas and, and other things, philodendrons, things that we still have growing today in our tropics collection. And I love this image. This is actually outside, though it looks like it might be inside the conservatory. This was a palm promenade, a, a walk filled, uh, filled with palms. They would put the palms out every year during the warm times. Uh, these two ladies were out in the palm walk and those little windows and stuff you see in the, in the background are actually the, the US Capitol. So this was done in an angle in front of the conservatory, uh, but a really cool image there from that era. So our location is really relevant to the next point in our history. And I wanted to share this really large aerial map that was an illustration done by Courier and Ives of the very famous Christmas card fame. Um, but kind of shows you what was happening by 1892 in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to zoom in here, specifically look right in front of the Capitol, in that western front of the Capitol. You see our conservatory and gardens there. Just to the left of us, you see there was a train station. Um, to the left of that, you can see the Smithsonian Castle and some of the, uh, that's the Arts and Industries building beside it. There was a lot of stuff in the middle of the National Mall. That becomes an issue. Because as the original plan had been laid out for Pierre L'Enfant for the, for the new federal city, there was going to be a, a long alley of very open views directly from the U.S. Capitol back to the Washington Monument. Clearly, there was a lot of stuff blocking that view. Congress formed a, a uh, committee uh, headed by uh, Mr. McMillan, and um, the so-called McMillan plan really came into effect. And the idea there is that they wanted to create that open vista, which means everything in the middle of the National Mall, including the Botanic Garden, had to move. Here are some of those gentlemen talking with uh, director at that time, Hess, George W. Hess. He's on the right side there with the mustache. Um, at the Fountain University Conservatory in the background, this was 1924. We were the last item on the National Mall to move. Um, by 1904, the legislation was in place to start moving everything and creating um, the, the open LA. But there were strong contenders that did not want the Botanic Garden to move. We had mature trees, we had mature gardens. There were a lot of supporters that really said, we don't want the garden to move. And so it took a long time for them to decide what to do with us. And in fact, this is one of the plans that was proposed to potentially move the Botanic Garden out of the mall and greatly expand our space, this is a map drawn for a potential relocation of the Botanic Garden into Northeast Washington, D.C. We did not ultimately move there. And in fact, this land is used today for plant purposes. This land instead became a site for the Department of Agriculture, and it is the United States National Arboretum. But I love this plan of what might have been had we been moved up to Northeast D.C. Instead, we moved a few hundred feet to the south. And this is the uh, cornerstone laying, that's the architect of the Capitol at the time holding the travel there. And you might recognize George Hess by now and with mustache there, the second from the left. Um, they were laying the cornerstone for our new conservatory. The year was 1931. Um, and they constructed over the course of two years. Check out this crazy construction image. So scaffolding is up a year in, this is 1932. For scale, look at the tide and gentlemen right in the middle of the image uh, in front of the U.S. Capitol Dome. Um, they were building this brand new conservatory, even bigger 
on uh, essentially what is now the south side of Maryland Avenue, Southwest. Um, and it finally was finished in 1933. This photo was taken a few years into its, into its run. This photo was in the 1970s. You might know if you're a car aficionado. But I like the image. This was taken from the uh, Rayburn uh, House Office building. But it really shows the new conservatory as it was built. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's the one that we still have today. So if you've come to the conservatory, that same design is what you're uh, walking through today. Uh, this new one was the largest aluminum frame structure in the entire United States at the time that when it opened. It had two courtyard gardens and 10 garden rooms under glass with a total of over 28,000 square feet of growing space. So a great sort of new iteration of our conservatory, kind of taking a peek inside. We've been welcoming visitors to this um, conservatory now for well, 90 years almost. Um, this was a photo from the 60s with some military veterans that were visiting, and we still continue to support our military families today. We're a Blue Star member um, celebrating uh, access for military families. And I love this other photo. This is the desert house at the time with uh, kind of continuing some of those plants you saw earlier from 19, uh, 1910, some of the desert collection. This was from the 1960s. And I wanted to share this specifically from inside of the new conservatory because you're going to see an even newer photo um, later on. But uh, we've been welcoming people to the same conservatory since then. But you might remember there was something else really large um, that also had to move. The Bartoldi Fountain, the Fountain of Light and Water. So it also had to move out of the middle of the National Mall. They moved it on the south side of the new conservatory and built gardens around it and created Bartoldi Park. So same time frame, 1931 to 1933, the fountain was placed in the center. And it, for many decades, functioned to show current horticultural trends. Um, this was part of the Bicentennial Exposition of the United States. So this was 1976, and there was a really cool floral display um, that showed the United States and celebrating the 13 original colonies, all made out of plants. Um, so this is a cool photo from that era. And this is showing some of those other, other horticultural trends um, in the last decade and the conservatory there behind it. I just love that sort of soft sunset photo. If you've been to Bartoli Park, you know it's, a, it's got some great places to walk and sit and meander. Um, the fountain itself has had a renovation. So if you've been in DC for a while, you might remember this. Three years, 2008 to 2011, the fountain needed some work, right? It was, it itself was 150 years, over 150 years old. It needed some work to get updated electrical and plumbing needed a new base to be leveled. It had a huge basin at the top, and if it's not perfectly level, the water doesn't fall evenly on all sides of the fountain. So it needed a, to, some rework. This is a photo of the caryatids that stand under the basin. Um, they were being craned off and, and removed as part of the, the process of the restoration. It was all coming back together, and in August of 2011, DC had an earthquake. Uh, damaged several places throughout the city, including um, the National Cathedral and some others, and the director, executive director at the time, Holly Shimizu, was just over in the administration building, not far from this fountain. It was being reassembled and put back together. She was so concerned. She ran outside, checked on the fountain, and luckily everything was perfectly safe and sound, um, and there was not any damage to the fountain. So we were very happy to report that. So it was fully re uh, renovated, and check out this beautiful shot taken right after the renovation. So this was the newly updated fountain all working in good order. Um, you see this beautiful evening shot there. So it's a great space, still lit up in the evenings as it has been ever since it joined us in 1877. It's a great spot. And so I, I highly recommend, you know, if you've not been around to see it lit up at night, it's beautiful. We have a lot of plants, over 50,000 still to this day growing, right? We only have, you know, roughly 10 acres total between the conservatory and all of our outdoor gardens. We don't have enough space for all of those plants so we have some production greenhouses, right? You saw in those old photos from the 1800s, early 1900s, there were some small greenhouses right beside the conservatory, and those existed all the way up into the 1930s. But really, there came a point in time that we needed a, an off-site large greenhouse. So one was built about two miles away in an area called Poplar Point in southwest Washington, D.C. It had 24 greenhouses. However, in the 1980s, the Metro um, for DC said, we actually think we wanna build a new Metro station right there in Poplar Point. We'd like to have the land that you're on. And we said, okay, we'll give you the land if you'll build us a new production facility. And so they did. They built us a new production facility 
Um, not super far away, still in Southwest Washington, D.C. So it's about a 15 minute, 15 minute drive between the conservatory down to that, that area. Um, and it is there today, opened in 1994. This is a photo from inside one of the 34 greenhouse bays built on 25 acres of land. It's a working production facility, so typically not open to the public. We do open typically every spring for an open house that we've been doing for many years, inviting the public to come in, check out the, uh, the production facility, talk with our employees and learn about what's going on. This year, we did it virtually. Um, and so if you didn't see the really cool series of virtual production facility open house videos, those are on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook. We'd love to have you jump in and see a little bit of the behind the scenes of how this functioning work, uh, house works. But if you think about you know, us growing thousands of poinsettias every year, that happens in one of the 34 greenhouse bays. Uh, Lydia's so good, she's dropping in the playlist there. So that's the playlist that'll jump you into those production facility open house videos. It's a great series. This is an aerial, so you really get a sense of the scale of the, of the large size of this production facility. And it really is very important to us growing up seasonal plants, but also housing a lot of our collection that we just don't have space for all to be on display at one time. Some of the things in the conservatory, like our thousands of orchids, will circulate through. In fact, this is taken of Dr. Susan Pell, who's on our, on our program with us this evening, helping answer questions. Um, she's standing there talking to some visitors during a previous production facility open house in one of those orchid rooms. With several thousand orchids, we typically will cycle them up to the conservatory when they're in bloom and then take them back to the production facility when they're not. However, the next point in our history, if we're coming up forward through time, by the 1980s, the conservatory itself was having some issues. The plumbing, the heating, the cooling systems, they were outdated, and especially concerning the glass coating that was on the actual panes of glass was deteriorating and not allowing as much light into the plants. That's a major issue. Um, and in fact, in the year 1992, the center palm house roof had to be removed for safety purposes because it was just not as structurally sound as they wanted. And that's what this photo shows. You see that central um, construction or greenhouse area that is open and it's just scaffolding instead of being glass. That's that palm house with the open area removed. So it fully closed for a full renovation all the way down to the ground from 1997 to 2001. So two years in, this you can see pulled all the way down to the ground, 1997 it started. By 1999, they were starting to rebuild the, the, um, the scaffolding uh, or the, the framework of the building off from scratch. And the very next year, by 2000, it's really come into shape. And there's some new additions happening. So if you look there, sort of on the, the bottom left corner of the conservatory, there's a whole new area on the back side of the conservatory that really helps us function as employees. There's some offices there. There's some, um, some greenhouse working spaces for them to bring plants in and, and work with them and do various pieces of, of sort of behind the scenes work before things go out into the, the rest of the conservatory, which is almost all public space. Um, so they needed a little bit of working space in the back. So that's what's being added there. By 2001, Here's that newly renovated, bright and shiny new conservatory. Um, this was right before it opened, and it didn't quite open as planned. Some people immediately ask, oh my gosh, you took it down to the, to the ground. What happened to the plants? So I wanted to show these photos, especially because we have four of those historic plants, right, that date back to 1842. These are the male and female cycads that you saw, those palm-looking plants that are in the garden court being removed. Uh, a lot of our plants, what we could keep at the production facility went there, but a lot of our botanic garden partners and friends, colleagues helped us out. So things like Smithsonian Gardens, other locations, in fact, some of our plants went down to Florida, some of the ones that needed sunshine and warmth. But these were two of those, um, those uh, cycads being removed for safekeeping during that renovation. I love those, those images. So 2001, this is an image of uh, the medicinal house as it has looked through its years. Um, this is not the most up-to-date photo. We've changed our interpretive signage a little bit. So I wanna showcase this point in history. We were slated to open October 15th, but we didn't. If you remember back in 2001, there was an anth anthrax um, through the mail coming to Capitol Hill. And because we were not open, we actually played a security role in that, um, in that time. Um, because the, the garden had not been open, it had not received mail in the conservatory, we served as a safe haven and served as the Anthrax Command Center for the United States Capitol Complex for two months. And uh, we delayed our opening until December 11th to serve Capitol Hill as that, um, as that command center, which is, I think is a cool piece of history. 
So one of the major things that happened in the renovation, in addition to just structural elements, was automation. And so we had a computer system that really helps us keep every separate room in the conservatory within a certain degree temperature, help keep the humidity at the right images. This is a, a screen grab I took from a video um, that one of our operations team employees took for me, high up on the high cat wall, looking down in the tropics house. So this is really high up in that, that top dome. These are misters releasing mist to keep the humidity level high. You can also see some, um, some window screens, some sunshades there on uh, the backside of the conservatory. They're really helping control both the temperature, how many hours of sunlight, you have lots of capabilities to control things throughout the different rooms, open and close the windows, all sorts of stuff. The computer system really helps out a lot. And then we added our newest garden space. So here from this aerial image, you can see the conservatory. You can see Bartholdi Park there on the other side. And there's this large open space. It had been opened. Um, it was had some other things on it through the years. But at this point, fully cleared out because in the 1980s, there was desire for a rose garden to be built somewhere on Capitol Hill. Um, the spouses, several spouses of Congress members kind of all worked together to really rally behind this cause. And by 1986, they um, helped Congress declare the rose as the national floral emblem. So really building up to this idea, three acres immediately west of our conservatory were chosen to build a new rose garden. So that's what we're going to dive into is what this became called the National Garden. It was to be funded completely by non-federal money, and so um, there was a nonprofit called the National Fund for the United States Botanic Garden. It was created in 1991 to raise money for this. And one of the cool fundraising elements was 1997, uh, the United States Mint released a silver dollar specifically to help fundraise for the new National Garden. You see the rose on one side there with our name, United States Botanic Garden, 1820-1995. And on the other side, um, there is a image of our conservatory. And uh, there was also a special currency and coin set that was released, really celebrating our links back to George Washington and the founding fathers. A lot of really cool detailed history. You can still find these from coin sales people um, that sell collectible coins and stuff, or you know some of the online places like eBay and places like that. Um, we don't endorse any specific company, just saying if you were a coin collector and were interested in having a piece of our history, they are available. You can find them in various places online. Uh, the nonprofit continues to exist. Even afterwards, they were able to continue, and they exist today called the Friends of the U.S. Botanic Garden. They continue to support more than 200 educational programs for us every year, so they're still a really key partner in education program. This was the other marquee fundraiser, and I love some, some of the images from this. 1994, fundraising gala, six living first ladies attended. Check out this photo. What a cool moment in history. However, they weren't the only distinguished guests. Merv Griffin was the master of, of ceremonies along with Phyllis George. There was an address by President Bill Clinton, and there was entertainment provided by Johnny Mathis. These are screen grabs from the digitized version of this entire gala program. It was filmed by C-SPAN. You can actually watch the entire thing. Um, still housed online. You can find it on our website, um, or you can, I think C-SPAN might also have it on their, web, uh, their website as well. But if you look for 1994 First Ladies Botanic Garden Gala, you can find it in multiple places. It's a really fun watch of seeing this fundraising uh, and cool piece of our history with a lot of marquee people. So what happened? Here is the plan that was laid out for creating this National Garden. So if you look down the bottom right, the sort of red area, there's the Rose Garden. And they were able to, to actually add a lot of garden spaces in addition to the Rose Garden. There's a butterfly garden, that lawn terrace is where we created that stickwork sculpture that you saw. There's a First Lady's Water Garden that was um, created to really honor the First Ladies and their commitment to helping with us. And all of the area, the two-thirds area to the list, is called the Regional Garden. And that is an area of native mid-Atlantic plants. And we're able to really celebrate mid-Atlantic plants. There's a stream and a pond area, an amphitheater for some live interactive either classes or concerts and various things. And here is an updated aerial, that very same area we saw earlier, fully planted out. It was... Uh, Construction started in 2001 and it opened in 2006. So we just celebrated its 10th anniversary in 2016. So it's really young in our 200 years of history. But if you've been to the garden today, you've probably meandered through some of these outdoor spaces and we love them. We use them a lot for a lot of our educational classes. This is that amphitheater um, that I was talking about. The seats here are actually built with stone that was removed from the Capitol at one point. 
Um, so a really cool connection to our uh, sister building there on the hill. Libby is doing such a good job. She's, she's dropping in all sorts of good stuff for you guys in the chat. She's linked to the specific video in C-SPAN that you can watch for that tribute for the First Ladies in the fundraising gala. And she's even dropped in some information about the 10th anniversary of the National Guard. Thanks so much, Libby. It opened up, this was when things were still quite young. You can see the plants are small here. You can see the conservatory in the background, the Capitol behind. This is some of that pond area that you can still walk through today. And of course, there had to be roses, right? That was the whole reason that this started. This was when the Rose Garden was really young and had first opened. Um, and I love this shot sort of situating you there with the Capitol behind. And look at this, just beautiful roses. We continue to have a Rose Garden today. Um, and I happen to know that Sharon is on volunteer. Oh yeah, Libby's tagged Sharon. Sharon has uh, used to take care of our roses and still has come back many times through the years to lead tours of our Rose Garden. And uh, we love those. Maybe we'll be able to have her back in the future to lead on-site tours of our Rose Garden. Uh, yeah, so that's the National Garden. Joined us really late in life, right? Um, our next point in our chronology here is 2016. Uh, Bartholdi Park, as I mentioned, was created, opened in 1933 hadn't really had a renovation since it was created. And there was a brand new memorial that was created right beside us, the um, American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial, part of the National Park Service, right there beside us. And we said, you know what, this is an opportunity to both renovate the, the park, do a lot of sustainable integration and add accessible features, which would really benefit any visitors crossing the street there from the new um, uh, memorial next door. So this is a photo kind of looking through the park after the renovation. And I wanted to share a few different photos. So the things you see in front of us, those red hibiscus, those are planted in one of the 10 rain gardens. Reducing rainwater run runoff is a big component of the Sustainable Sites Initiative. We're actually able to capture all of the rain garden in more than 96% of rains throughout the year. So we're really excited to be able to capture that, sink it back into the ground instead of putting it into the stormwater system that would run out in DC. Our, our predominant system is a combined sewer overflow system, so it would combine with the sewer and run into the river. We've reduced that. We reused a lot of plants and materials that were previously in the park. We used locally sourced materials, so that furniture is built out of white oak from Virginia that fell naturally in a derecho storm back several years ago. We celebrate native plants. More than 50% of the plants in the Bartholdi Park today are native plants. And it serves as both wildlife food and habitat and a place for humans with increased accessibility uh, on lots of human health features. And uh, I think the Bartholdi Park has really come a long ways through this renovation to be both more sustainable, but continue celebrating as a sort of what you can do in today's era in your own garden. This is a lot of people enjoying those uh, new furniture. It's a great place with lots of chairs and tables and stuff through, throughout the, the nice weather to come sit forever on uh, Capitol Hill or visiting. We'd love to see you there. But the Sustainable Sites Initiative is really near and dear to our heart because we help co-create it. It's uh, essentially the Sustainable Sites Initiative. It's kind of like the lead certification for a building, saying it meets environmental standards. And we created it with the American Society of Landscape Architects and Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And so it is run today by the Green Building Council, the same people that run the lead certification. So they can certify landscapes as environmentally friendly. And our own Bartoli Park is certified as a site's gold site. And we're very excited about that. Almost up to 2020, up to 200 years. So 2019, we did a really cool new project. We added a green roof on top of the conservatory. So this is our employees and one of our volunteers planting out more than 29,000 plants. And I love it because it's a research project that is uh, that we're working with a professor at a University of Maryland, looking at can native plants actually function as well as the traditional sedums that are used most frequently on green roofs. Here's a photo comparing the two. Um, so there's some of the native plants. You can see a really cool pollinator on a flower there in the native plant area. This is a photo of sedums, more traditional succulents that are typically used. Um, and we'd love it if, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful, maybe the native plants can turn out to be as good or better than the sedums in providing uh, and capturing the rainwater. But maybe they might also be able to offer some extra good stuff for their, our pollinators and wildlife. Really excited about that, uh, that green roof. So 2020. Right, last year comes around, we turn 200, what do we do? So early in the year in February, we opened two exhibits back to back. One, all about us, this, this 200 years of us growing and sharing plants with millions of visitors through the years, USBG at 200, deeply rooted and branching outward. 
And this is our executive director on the left, Dr. Saharmoon Chapatin, and Susan Pill, who's on the program with us tonight, standing in our garden court with tons of orchids, because our orchid show that we do in partnership with Smithsonian Gardens also opened in February of last year, because flags hanging overhead spell out discover orchids, um, using um, some of the maritime flag system, uh, a nod to some of our historic circumnavigation uh, that would have brought back many plants through the years. So we get things up and running for a little while, and you know that um, the COVID pandemic started and really hit DC and, and the rest of the world hard. And by um, later on in March, we had to close. So we wanted to still be able to connect people with um, plants. And so we really pivoted hard and we started offering online programs, which ne we'd never done before. And so there are virtual tours that we recorded. There are all sorts of interactive elements that we added into a brand new section of our website. That's that link called usbg.gov slash at home. There's all sorts of good content there if you wanna jump in and celebrate some of these virtual offerings that we've added during the pandemic. And as I said, we've started adding lots of online programs. And so we've got a ton still upcoming. We're gonna continue offering them because we love talking about plants, sharing the beauty and the importance of plants. And so we're continuing to do that today. Um, I, there's gonna be some questions probably about also what's open today at the garden. Bartoldi Park, which you've seen, uh, and the Terrace Gardens around the conservatory are open today. Uh, if you want to go see those. Unfortunately, the conservatory and the National Garden with stated off are not yet open. Um, so continue to watch our social media and website for future updates about that. And we would love for you to be able to join us for part two because we've made it up to 200, but what happens from here, right? What are our major plant collections? What science and conservation programs and education are we doing? What's our goal for the future? That's all coming in a live panel discussion with our executive director. Susan's gonna join us as well as our horticulture manager and our public programs manager coming up on May 11th at 12 noon. We'd love for you to be able to join us there. And in the interim, the one other thing you can do um, is you can join us on social media and I'll give you those links in a minute. All of this really has really deep roots in two books that were created about our history. Um, and that's one from 1991 by Karen Solit. And there's this beautiful photo coffee table book. Both of these are digitally available on our website. If you go to that usbg.gov slash history, you can see PDF versions of both of these books. And used versions exist in used bookstores and on, on used, uh, used websites, used book websites. And finally, these are photos just from the last few weeks on our social media. If you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram or YouTube, we'd love if you interact and connect with us there. We love sharing, even during the pandemic, what's happening throughout the garden. We share beautiful things. We share educational things. That's one of our native plant series posts there on the bottom left. So we'd love for you to join us there. And I see... Susan has come back online because we want to answer a few questions that she wasn't able to answer uh, in the chat. And so, Susan, what do you got? Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, I think I answered pretty much all the questions, but I could sort of extrapolate on some of them. I think one of the questions was about the corpse flower. They saw the wonderful sculpture that we have in the gallery right now and asked, do we have any live ones? We do. We have about 15 that are mature on a blooming age. Um, and we have dozens of others that we've grown up from seeds. And actually we can report that um, we had a successful pollination in the two that bloomed last fall. And so now we have dozens and dozens and dozens of seeds that we will be germinating. And then we will share those resulting plants with other public gardens. There's another plant in that same Amorphophallus family, stinky plants that we just spotlighted on our social media platforms yesterday, a really cool series of about 17 or 18 photos including a cross cut showing what's happening inside the plant that our gardener Stephen took. Um, so if you wanna learn more about some of the, that cool family, um, check out our Facebook and Instagram. I think there's also a question about um, sort of our relationship with the US National Arboretum. And I answered that question, but another one that we frequently get is, are we Smithsonian? Are we National Park Service? And Devin answered uh, sort of the, the larger question of where we belong in the federal government early in this talk. And that is that we are in the legislative branch. We've always been in the legis legislative branch and we've never been affiliated with any of those other organizations, although we do frequently partner with all of them. So with the Arboretum, with Smithsonian, um, and certainly with National Park Service as well. There's been actually six points in our history. Um, one of our, our previous executive director had done a lot of research. There's been six decision points that Congress has made through our 200 years about should we still report to Congress? Should we be given over to Department of Agriculture or Smithsonian? And I love that every time in those six decision points, they decided to keep us um, there at the base of the Capitol and uh, reporting to Congress. 
And I love our location, despite being really, you know, size constrained, because of our location, we're really able to, to celebrate plants and connect so many people with plants because of our location, because we're right beside the Capitol and Smithsonian's. And so, um, so it's a great, it's a great blessing anyways, to still be right there on that little spot right on the National Mall. We love it. I see a question from Cynthia here about netting um, outside for cicadas. And I will say, we don't anticipate having a lot of cicadas emerging at the garden because we have disturbed the soil so much um, in the last 17 years. So certainly um, the, you know, the National Garden uh, has been heavily disturbed uh, just 11 years ago. Um, and then also Bartholdi Park when we redid it as well. And so probably won't have a lot of merging, but they will be certainly flying to the garden. And we don't at this time have any plans for netting them, but that remains to be seen. If it becomes a real problem, then we may have to, uh, to try to protect the collection in various ways. And in fact, we have a program in partnership with the National Arboretum all about cicadas coming up really soon. Um, I'm actually going to drop a this link Saturday. to that. Yeah, I'm dropping a link to that in response okay. to Cynthia's question. Okay, I, already, I dropped it already, Devin. Oh, you're in the chat. Perfect. Yes. We got it in both locations. Fantastic. Okay. Looking at their other, other questions here. Um, you know, we've, this was super, super high level story of really looking at how do we functionally get from point A to point, you know, C, 200 years in. Um, and we've got so many cool pieces of our history that, that we didn't get to dive here. So if you are interested in learning more about us, um, one, you can check out the two books, but also you can ask if you're ever, you know, joining us uh, on site in the future, or if you want to send questions to our, our usbg at aoc.gov email address. And we love hearing what questions you might have and sharing what we might know about it. Oh, you guys are saying such nice things in the chat. We're so glad that you're able to join us. You know, we're really honored to be able to continue this legacy 200 years in into the future. And, uh, and I love that, you know, George Washington and founding fathers thinking about plants, food and agriculture, still a core component for us today. We do a lot of urban agriculture work uh, and we have a large economic plants collection that really celebrates food plants, both inside and out. Got a question from Allison here. Have there always been really big doors for the interior of the garden? And I am, I'm thinking probably inside the conservatory is what um, yeah. talking about there. And uh, yeah, the conservatory doors are actually um, at this point sort of considered historic to their design and what they look like. And so those have been original to the conservatory since it was built in the thirties and uh, we'll maintain those doors. We call them monumental doors. Uh, they are quite large. What's Good the day. vision for the next 50 years? I think program and uh, we will we'll probably touch on that. Um, so definitely tune in uh, what, to see what our, what our vision is for the future. Oh, they're asking, is the presentation available after today? So we did record this um, and our goal is to be able to, pro to provide a link to a video recording afterwards. Um, so hopefully, as long as technology yeah. is on our side and nothing goes wrong, we should be able to, to provide that for you. And anyone who's registered will get an email saying when it goes live. So we'll, we'll let everybody know. Also a question. The the glory of Devin. Question in the chat. Uh, that person could not make the program. The next program, will that one be on our web page? And uh, Libby, I would anticipate that it will be. Is that accurate? The part the two? Next program, yes, part two will also be recorded and will be eventually be posted on um, usbg.gov slash online programs. In the, the pre-McMillan Mall are those houses where the garden is now. Ooh, trying, to, to, trying to remember that specific question. Um, yeah, there were quite a few questions about who lived um, and, and what, what do we know about the grounds before the garden was there? So I don't know if you want to touch on that. Yeah, you know, we don't have, we don't have any dis definitive records, but I mean, DC, since it's, existence since it was created has had people who live in it. And so, you know, there were people as today that were living in houses right beside the Capitol uh, building. And um, today the Capitol Hill neighborhood still exists just a block or two from the Capitol building. There are people with houses. Um, and that was the same there on the south side of the Capitol. Um, there were houses there in the area that um, eventually where we were moved to that were, um, that were taken away. And so that's, as things moved and changed, yeah, houses, houses were taken away as well. Yeah, there was quite a few buildings. There's a little bit of information. Um, there was some kind of a bar or other sort of maybe shadier establishment that was uh, where Bartholdi Park is today. Um, and uh, maybe we a school. found some evidence. Yes, yeah, we certainly found some evidence of, of brick buildings when we did the, the Bartholdi Park mm -hmm. um, renovation. 
versus for it to be a sustainable sites location. And uh, mostly we just found bricks though and a few bottles, nothing, you know, no other artifacts, anything like that. I will say that the book that Devin plugged, the Karen Solit uh, book, which is actually her master's thesis on the history of the US Botanic Garden up to 1991, um, you can download that from our website for free, and uh, it has a little bit more information about sort of the history of mm. what was happening, not just at the garden, but kind of in D.C., in the country at the time through, you know, looking through the lens of the Botanic Gardens history. But she peppers in a lot of other history that, that is very interesting to, to sort of in the context of, of the time. I see in the, the questions, Chris Ferner is asking, will some of the great links shared be added to the follow-up email? Um, and so Libby is saying, not specifically, I think the easiest thing, um, if you check out that history page, that usbg.gov slash history, that one might stick in your memory. There's a lot of the links to things that you can get to from that page. The books are on that page. The Flickr historic images are on that page. So that'll really get you into the, a lot of the meat of this presentation. Yeah, and, and uh, Kevin in the chat has also pointed out that there's a cultural landscape report um, for sort of all of the different sort of parts of the capital or there, some of them have already been done and some of them um, are in progress. And the, the, the cultural landscape report that pertains to where the garden is currently and where it was historically has been completed. And there is information in that about the use of the land, what things were here prior to what's there now and how it's changed over time. So there's good information there and that's an AOC publication. I love this question from Allison. Are there any ghost stories about the garden grounds? Do you guys, have you heard any ghost stories? I have no good ghost stories, unfortunately. I mean, I feel like we should start making some up, though. But you, yeah, nothing. Sounds like a good idea for a future sort of fall walk. Um, we definitely have some plants with fun ghost-related names. Um, and so... We have a, some orchids that look like ghosts. Yes, we have all sorts of good ghost-related items, just not actual ghosts. Um, and then another question Elizabeth Thiessen asked about the building slash house in Bartholdi Park. That was built when Bartholdi Park was created and opened in 1933 as a home for the executive director and his family at the time. He was living on the grounds to kind of keep a watch for things, um, you know, all, all evening, um, all day to kind of keep a watch on things. Back in the 60s, it actually was converted from a living residence into office building. And so there's a number, it's the administrative building now for the garden. And there's a number of us that have offices in that former house. Yeah, and the house, it was actually only used as a house for a few years before it was converted for use as office space. And um, it's, uh, you can see a lot of the sort of remnants of it being a house, uh, which, is, which is pretty neat. And a few years ago, this is kind of a fun side fact, we got a knock on the door of the admin building and it was the, uh, the grandson of the uh, director who had lived in the, in the um, admin building. Ooh, Cynthia is, is in the chat saying the corpse flower sounds like a likely major player for some of the ghost stories. Yeah, that's a great tie. Good job, Cynthia. Uh, yeah. Oh, you guys are wonderful. As we, you know, we are very proud to be a part of the, the garden's history and the garden itself, I think, is such a great institution and, and such a unique thing to be right here at the base of the Capitol still 200 years later. Um, and so, you know, hopefully for another 200 years and beyond, we'll continue to exist and thank millions of more people with plants.